This Saturday afternoon at Arrowhead Stadium, we have two teams that kind of feel like they're on the brink, teetering on their season. We'll talk about that next here on Locked on Horn Frogs and Locked on Jayhawks. It's your team every day. You are Locked on Horn Frogs, your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. That's right, your team every day got a special edition of the show today. In the box next to me, if you're watching on YouTube, is Derek Johnson at D Johnson Radio on Twitter. And he does Locked On Jayhawks, which is the daily Kansas pod. And Derek, I thought we would start here. TCU is falling below expectations right now. The season hasn't started like fans wanted wanted it to. I know Kansas is in a similar spot, but Kansas really had, I mean, there was some like dark horse Big 12 championship talk possible playoff appearance type thing. They're one in three, but they've been really close games. And I saw you pointing out after that West Virginia game, like this team feels like they could be four or no. So I guess what's the vibe right now about who this group is and, you know, can they salvage this moving forward? It's really hard to say because if they continue to be on the same path they've been on, you would think they're going to get a couple you know, fortunate bounces their way. I guess maybe literally when you, mm-hmm. you see how that UNLV game ended with that fumble that happened there um, to where, you know, they, like you said, could easily be 4 0. You're not going to win every close one score game and, unless you have that special type of season. So maybe you'd be three and one even, but that gives you hope that they are better than the record indicates. Mm-hmm. The, the scare here, though, is that by being one and three, the confidence drops up. You, you start getting down the dumps a little bit. The fan support's not there as much. And then all of a sudden, instead of even being in the close games where you have the chance of winning, that even drops off before it. So this is a really pivotal moment for Kansas. I mean, obviously, like you said, it's it's kind of desperation for both teams at this point in time. And for KU playing at home, you're going at Arizona State after this, who all of a sudden looks like a good opponent. You know, you lose this game, you could be staring at one and five very easily. So th- this is uh, back against the wall for KU. So Jalen Daniels, I know there's a ton of excitement around him getting back and being healthy, and he stayed healthy so far. Turnovers have been an issue. Is it just inconsistency that's been the big problem? Are you still seeing those special moments from him? It's just about putting together a full game. You know, there there were a couple throws in the West Virginia game where it felt like vintage Jalen. There's one in the first half where he kind of He's forced to turn around and scramble one way, go back the other way, and then throw, I don't know, 15 yards down the field to the sideline. It was a beautiful throw. But we haven't seen that really consistently. The explosive plays have just kind of gone away for Kansas so far this season. The big plays have kind of gone away for Kansas so far this season. I don't know how much of that is Jalen Daniels struggling. I don't know how much of that is losing Andy Kotelnicki, who has gone to Penn State and just had like 700 yards last week and has done good things so far. Probably a little bit of both. Um, I don't know I, that I've ever seen something like this happen at the collegiate level. You see it at the professional level, guys get old or a barrage of injuries happen over the course of their career. They just fall off or whatever. They get past their prime, whatever it is. And I guess you could say Jalen's had different injuries that to deal with, but like, I don't know, like at the collegiate level, we see guys uh, running backs tear their ACL and then the next year they're back and they're running for a thousand yards. And so he had the injury. I think the bigger deal was the rust he's, he's wearing off because it's not just that he missed basically – you know, all of last season after the back injury, it's that he didn't really play in spring ball. It was very limited. He didn't really do much in summer ball. It was very limited. Like even the fall practice was maybe a little bit limited at the very start to where he looks like somebody who is still trying to get in rhythm with everybody. Uh, But the biggest thing has been the interceptions. He's been throwing costly interceptions. I mean, he already has seven interceptions so far this season. That's two more than uh, anybody else in the conference. And they've been costly interceptions. The Illinois one uh, at the end of the first half on a bubble screen that gets returned for a touchdown. You know, you lose that game by less than a touchdown. That could have been a big swing. The UNLV game, you throw an interception when you're up with a chance to add more to the lead before the end of the half. They go down, they get a touchdown right before half. Again, you you lose that game by less than a touchdown. Um, So the interceptions have been very costly, and they've just kind of been – really bad interceptions. Like it just hasn't looked at all like the same guy. So you did it beautifully there. I always butcher his name, but Andy Kolonecki, he leaves <laughs> for Penn state in the off season. And I feel like that was kind of an underreported thing. I'm, I'm sure it wasn't around your neck of the woods because people following the team closely understand who he is and what type of play caller he is. But 
I remember a lot of people giving Kansas a ton of hype, and I would agree with it, but I did have this question of like, okay, new play caller, what does this offense look like? As an outsider, I feel like Jeff Grimes is getting a lot of heat right now. Um, do you feel like he is being unfairly maligned? And I guess co- going with that, what are some of the big differences between what he's trying to do and what they were doing in the previous offensive system? So I definitely thought Andy Kotelniki was going to be a huge loss and was going to do well at Penn State, but I kind of undersold it personally, and I kind of bought into uh, the hype. I kind of drank the Kool-Aid a little bit of the idea that, okay, well, he wasn't the coordinator for the bowl game. They have their quarterback's coach step up. They still put up 49 points against UNLV. They have Jason Bean throw for six touchdowns. You have Jeff Grimes, who came to the practices for the bowl games, got integrated with the offense. You know, he was part of a Big 12 championship Baylor team, and he was part of the BYU team with Zach Wilson that helped him get drafted in the top five with a balanced attack with Tyler Algier and stuff, to where I bought into the idea that Kansas was still going to be okay. And the idea was that they were going to run a lot of the concepts they were going to be having, and it was just going to be Jeff Grimes kind of adding a few things, adding his own flavor, but it was going to be the same ice cream at the end of the day. And I think one of the other key losses for KU in addition is Matt Lubick. He was a analyst for the team for the past couple of years. He's actually the analyst who brought in the like triple option, spread option concepts that they've been running the last few years. He was the one who brought it into Kolnicki's offense. He since took over as the offensive coordinator for this year at Nevada. And Nevada, the record doesn't look great, but I think they're two and three. Last year they went two and ten, and they've been a lot right. better. Like he's made a big impact there. He was somebody who he might have been the offensive coordinator. They might have hired internally. He was going through a cancer battle uh, when they were going through the hire. And so there was too much uncertainty. They ended up going with Grimes. So I, Grimes has kind of been scapegoated and is kind of public enemy number one for the blame game when you're looking at that here locally. Uh, I, I think it's been hard to determine how much of Jalen's struggles have been him, how much has been Jeff Grimes. There was an interesting comment this week from Jeff Grimes at a press conference talking about that. Uh, He feels like Jalen and the receivers are still trying to get on the same page and find that rhythm, which that would go to the idea of rust. Uh, But certainly there's been probably too many bubble screens. I mean, there was in the UNLV game, probably six or seven bubble screens and it starts to get repetitive. One of them was on a critical second down and two when a touchdown would have put Kansas up two scores. They end up getting the field goal. UNLV gets a touchdown and uh, the rest is history as they win that game. You throw the interception on the bubble screen against Illinois and kind of a, where I think it was a second straight bubble screen on a play. There's been too many of that. Um, there hasn't felt like as much tight end usage with Andy Kotelnicki. There's been more jet sweeps and reverses. Those plays have actually worked pretty well for KU to this point in time, but more just straight deep passes, whereas with the Kotelnicki offense, it felt like the big plays were manufactured organically. It would be a 15-yard pass that then, you know, you had 20 yards of room to run after it with this offense. It feels like they're trying to, okay, let's, Hey, we need a big play. Let's throw it 30 yards down the field. So it's been a little bit different. I don't think it's been the smoothest transition, but it's also very tough to tell, you know, if Jalen Daniels were playing like classic Jalen Daniels, would the offense be humming just fine? I don't know. Man, it's too bad. You guys couldn't get UNLV before those NIL checks. No, right? <laughs> what a wild story today, but yeah, that was uh that was a really good – it was a good – it is a good team. Things will change now. But um, tough stretch of the schedule here for, for the Jayhawks for sure. Defensively, I mean, from a numbers perspective, it looks pretty solid, Derek. Has it been as, as promising as it looks on paper? And what are they doing well as a unit so far? Yeah, they, they've been good outside of like the key moments of the game. So I think they've given up, I, I forget what it is, like 42 points or something like that in quarters one through three this season combined. And then in the fourth quarter, it's like 35. It's right around there. So, I mean, they've struggled in the fourth quarter. And that's been unfortunate. If the offense would have scored more points, they would have had a bigger buffer. But like the Illinois game, they were great all game. And then the last two drives, they give up a, a touchdown and then they can't get off the field without giving up a field goal and too much time icing away. The UNLV game, they're great all game. And then UNLV has a big drive. They almost have the fumble. They convert a couple fourth downs and boom, UNLV scores and takes the lead. Um, and then the West Virginia game, they just completely fell apart. They gave up two touchdowns in the last three or four minutes of the game. So um, they've been good overall, but those closing minutes of the game, they have to figure something out. The run defense has been very good so far for KU outside of stopping running quarterbacks. Uh, that's been a problem against Green and Sluka. Fortunately, I don't think that's as big of an issue for this week's yeah. game against Hoover. Uh, but they've also given up a lot of big passes, and I think that could be problematic against TCU. And a big reason why, I, I do think they have good cover corners Maybe they've gotten you know sucked up a little bit trying to get big interceptions or something. But I think beyond that is that they're not getting a ton of production from 
their pass rushing defensive end spot right now. Um, and so teams just have a little bit longer to throw than they did last year when they had Austin Booker. But uh, for the most part, the defense has been better than than it was a season ago. And um, I think it's here to stay. But I think this is going to be a really interesting matchup because KU hasn't played a team that's going to chuck it around like this. Can TCU get up off the mat after an embarrassing performance against SMU last week? We'll get into that and more next year on Locked on Horn Frogs and Locked on Jayhawks, your team every day. So our friends at FanDuel, they've got uh, Kansas as one-and-a-half-point favorites right now. Almost a pick game there. That over-under for this ball game, 58-and-a-half, is a great time to join FanDuel as it always is. FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app. One $5 bet gets you $200 in bonus bets. That's a great deal. One $5 bet, you just put that down, $200 in bonus bets. College football, NFL, Major League Baseball playoffs coming up, whatever it is that you're interested in. FanDuel has it, and it's available for you. FanDuel.com or the FanDuel app. FanDuel is where the game starts. We appreciate their sponsorship here on the Lockdown Network. All right, Derek, go ahead and uh, let's let's fire away with some, some TCU questions here. So I've had a very hit or miss watching experience with TCU this year. I watched the first game against Stanford, and I was I was mm-hmm. pretty impressed with the defense outside of the abillion penalties that that they tried to get in that game. Right, right. Um, I, I've been impressed with the receivers. I watched a lot of the UCF game, and then I stopped watching. They, they blow the lead late. You know, last week against SMU, I didn't catch the game at first, and then I, I look at the scoreboard and I'm like, what's going on? Then I look at the box score and I'm like, okay, they just had five turnovers. They actually, I yarded them by a hundred yards. So. What do you think is the real TCU? I know that's kind of an open-ended question, but like it feels like you know you could make an argument that TCU is is better than the record after after Stanford you know goes out and beats Syracuse last week, all that sort of stuff. Um, I think there's a lot of talent on the team, but like what do you, what what is kind of the local expectations and and thoughts about where this program is right now? Well, it would be fascinating to see what happens if they could hold on against UCF. I know that butterfly effect could be true for, you know, all teams across the country, but they were really cruising going into halftime in that ball game. And uh, the defense was okay. They forced a couple field goal attempts, were able to get some blocks to keep UC off the scoreboard. And really, Derek, I mean, the second half, Gus Malzahn just went to running the football. And, I mean, K.J. Jefferson, um, Harvey, the running back, they were just coming downhill. And TCU has not had an answer for the run game over the last six quarters. Sonny Dyke said this week he thinks Kansas might run the ball like 70% of the time just because they haven't been able to stop it. But I think a lot of the confidence and intensity you saw from the team against Stanford on that side of the ball has kind of waned as they've had some struggles in year one under Andy Avalos. And offensively, um, they're sort of one-dimensional. I mean, they're really throwing the ball a lot. They've had issues running the football. They've their O-line has done pretty good in pass protection. They haven't been able to get much of a push so far. And, I mean, even against Long Island, the FCS opponent, like they struggled to run in obvious rushing situations. So that's been an issue as well. I think this team is talented. They have some pretty obvious flaws that they're going to have to work around. Uh, I feel like the biggest red flag, though, is the undisciplined nature of this group. It's, it's starting to feel like a trend with Sonny Dykes. You know, year one was so great. And everything fell into place. But since then, five and seven, and then the way this year started, there's just been too much careless football all the way around. And, you know, I mean, SMU, like that's a game they circled. They had a bye week before playing TCU. But you're coming off a big loss. It's a rivalry game. Like to immediately get punched in the mouth and fall behind 17 nothing doesn't set a great precedent. So I'm really curious to see how they come out, like just the intensity and effort level against Kansas, because I think that alone would help. But then you also have to execute and eliminate some of those dumb penalties and turnovers if you're going to be able to stay in these games. I think there's a path to them, you know, winning six or seven ball games and and finding a way to get this back on track. But I think they're going to have to outscore a lot of people, Derek. I I just – I don't – I feel like they got some personnel issues with this defense that they're not going to be able to overcome – and it's really more about can you improve somewhat in that area and can the offense kind of keep humming? I still have nightmares from the the game two years ago when uh, they couldn't stop Quentin Johnston. Uh, and, and I've really liked this receiving core. I, I don't know you know where it ranks among some of these good ones that TCU has had, but I, I feel like 
there's a lot of good options out there. H- how are they getting it done in the passing game specifically? Because it feels like the stats are there. It feels like they're putting up a lot of big numbers. But I'm curious, is it is it short passes? Is it intermediate? Is it long stuff? Like, what are they doing that's been so successful there? A little bit of everything. I mean, I think the short passing game, they've accentuated a lot because it's sort of supplemented the run game. So Kendall Browse has been pretty creative in – the screen game, you know, getting those quick outs, the RPO stuff that is high percentage passes for Josh Hoover. Um, they've got a lot of different dudes who can go catch the ball. Jack Besh has been a really surprising name. Like he came in, he was a freshman All-American at LSU. He was injured a lot last year, but going into the season, it felt like he was going to be a slot guy, like kind of an H-back dude you move around the formation. He's actually made the move to outside wide receiver, and he's done a really great job. He had 200 yards against UCF. Had another big game against SMU. Savion Williams is a big physical guy. Uh, Eric McAllister is a transfer from Boise State that they really like. And then J.P. Richardson has been very solid for another season in the slot. So it's a it's another year where they've got skill guys really everywhere that they feel good about, especially in that receiver room. And if they can block it up, you know, Josh has been – more confident, and I would say better than I thought. He's coming off a bad performance against SMU, but overall this year, he looks very decisive. He really hasn't put the ball in harm's way a lot, and he's just making the right decisions. And so, uh, yeah, even without the threat of much of a run game, they've been able to stay in rhythm and make a lot of plays through the air this year. Has there been anything for Josh Hoover specifically since – I don't know, I guess if you did go back to last year too, an inclusion of this year where it's been like that has been a common denominator when he has struggled or has maybe thrown more interceptions, like it's felt like that's been the difference. I think pressure is is a big deal. And so I'm I'm interested to see how they do this week because I know Kansas is more willing than the teams they've played so far to sort of dial up some exotic pressures and, and bring some heat. Uh, so that's one thing. Now, I mean, they, they get the ball out quick a lot. So they sort of limit that, but... Yeah, I would say when he makes mistake, mistakes, excuse me, it's pressure. And then it's also if he's if he has to go score for score with somebody or he gets behind, you start seeing him force some throws. Like he, he definitely forced some throws against SMU when they got behind last week. Uh in the season finale against Oklahoma last year, it was pretty obvious from the jump, like, okay, this is gonna be a game where you might need to score like 50 plus. And he was trying to just force some things that weren't there. So I think he gets a little ahead of himself at times, um, but yeah, he's he's been he's been good. But like most quarterbacks, I think if you get in his face, if you mess up that timing and rhythm, then he becomes a lot more uh, easy to stop for sure. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess when you, when you look at the defense side of the ball, like everybody is going to talk about, as, as you kind of mentioned with Sonny Dykes talking about the seventy percent Kansas running the football. Um, it, it felt like last week with SMU, I, I know they had been kind of going through a quarterback battle and, and Preston Stone, and I forget the name of the kid who started last week, who's more of a runner. Mm-hmm. feels like that was kind of uh, perfect to go against TCU for last week. Are you more worried about the Kansas running game in terms of the running backs? Are you more worried about the Kansas running game in terms of Jalen Daniels being able to run the football and this kind of being a revitalization game for Jalen Daniels? Or what worries you most uh, about a Kansas offense that so far hasn't been that great? Man, take your pick. I think really it's – and I know Jeff Grimes isn't necessarily known for this. He's more of a traditional running the football type of guy, but I I know he watches film too. And they've just really struggled with, you know, a lot of fly motion, bringing the receiver across the formation – faking that to him, faking the back, the zone read stuff, um, and honestly just kind of coming downhill. So UCF did that. I didn't think SMU could replicate it, but Jennings did a nice job, and they ran the ball really well. So I think they're going to see that until they stop it. And then, you know, in the secondary, JT Broughton um, is is their number one corner. He's kind of got thrown into action after a couple of injuries. He struggled. In, in man-to-man situations. So it, it's been kind of that catch-22 of you can't stop the run and then the passing game over the top starts to work because you're you're allocating more guys to that area of the field. But um, I, I guess I would say if I had to pick, they've struggled with mobile quarterbacks this year. And I know Daniels is not as big of a physical presence as the last two guys that they played but he's definitely someone who can get out in space and 
and make things happen. And I think even when he drops back to pass, if you're not able to stay in your rush lanes and contain, then there's a bunch of opportunities for big plays with him scrambling as well. So that would probably be my first concern with this matchup. So uh, when you're talking about desperation, uh, Sonny Dykes, is there any talk about hot seat? Because I, I think about this game being a back against the wall game for KU, but I don't know, like how much is that the case for TCU because of that? I mean, the fans definitely have them on the hot seat. When I was doing the post game show last week, it was the chat was was lighting up with it's time for this guy to go. Um, I would say it's getting turned up a little bit. You know, he's already fired a coordinator. He let Joe Gillespie, the DC, go after last year. My other thought, though, is Jeremiah Donati, the AD, like he's he's fairly patient, or at least it seems like he is. So if this thing just completely goes off the rails, his hand might be kind of forced. But I I believe if he has his choice, he wants to see Sonny get a third year, or a, I guess it'd be a you know fourth year to really kind of establish himself. Um, but it's an issue. I would say if they lose, you know, losing to KU on the road is not like a bad loss. But if you lose the next two games to Kansas and Houston and suddenly you're staring at two and four, then we're having some real deal conversations because this is a, a far cry from, you know, what they did in year one. And I think honestly, Derek, like his early success with that opening season is kind of working against him now because it's like, well, you've shown that you can do this. Was it just that you had, you know, Gary Patterson's players and a, a very experienced group that you were able to sort of get on the right path and get going, um, that could be that could be problematic because right now they don't look anything like that team that he started with. And and it it only seems like it's going, you know, further downhill at the moment. They got to turn this thing around. All right, let's finish things up. Keys to the game, predictions, all that sort of stuff. We'll do it next here on Locked On Horn Frogs and Locked On Jayhawks. Have you ever wanted to dip into the world of daily fantasy sports? Prize picks is the best place to do it. And you might say, I don't know anything about this. I don't know how to get involved. But, I mean, any major sport that you could be involved with, you can uh, start getting involved with on prize picks. And it's it's a lot of just over-under bets. It's not, you know, you have to pick a winner. It's individual players like Caleb Williams passing yards. Um, you can play – Along celebrities, there's all kinds of people that are involved with prize picks. It's the only real money daily fantasy platform with an injury insurance policy so that your lineup stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. So you don't have to worry about, am I just totally out of it if somebody gets hurt in the first quarter? Prize picks puts their members first, so all withdrawals are fast, safe, and secure. Um, download the prize picks app today and use the code locked on college and get $50 instantly. When you download that prize picks app and you use the code locked on college, $50 instantly to play prize picks. Download the app today. Okay, Derek. So if Kansas is going to pull this off, what are, uh, what are some of your keys to this matchup in this game? I got a hat right here. All right. Run the dang ball. Run ah, nice. the dang ball. That's what they got to do. Jalen Daniels has to be willing to run the football. You know, it's, it's felt like, really since the start of last year that Kansas has told Jalen Daniels, you got to protect yourself and, and deservedly. So he's had the injury bug and all that sort of stuff. So you don't want him taking big hits at this point. Jalen Daniels is struggling. The season is in dire jeopardy. It's time to let the governor off. You got to let him take the carries. You got to let him take the hits, fight for the yards. Devin Neal, 20 plus carries, Daniel high shot, 10 plus carries. You have to run the football, possess the football, keep the defense rested. I think beyond that on the defensive side of the football, uh, my big worry is that sometimes Brian Borland can play soft coverage back, loose coverage, especially after they gave up a lot of big passes to West Virginia last week. I'm worried that they're going to do that and they're just going to get nickel and dimed down the field. Um, but the counter to that is if you can at least maybe jump a few of them, Melo Dotson and Kobe Bryant have a bunch of interceptions in their career, then that can be kind of the swing thing. Uh, Kansas is one of the bottom 10 teams in the country right now in turnover margin. Got to at least be even in this game run the football well. What are the keys for you for TCU coming out on top? Well, on the flip side of that, I'd say stop the run. And, and for the TCU defense, I'm not even asking for punts. Like, can we just force some field goals occasionally? Let's just – let's take some steps in the right direction. Something's got to give here. This defense has not forced turnovers. I know, Derek, we've talked about Jalen Daniels and his trouble giving up the football. So, if you can force some turnovers in this ball game, that would be massive. And then – 
Uh, keep it going in the passing game. I don't really see TCU running the ball a lot here, but Josh Hoover and company have been very effective. Derek, I I said, you know, I know early in the week we were both kind of like, man, we're so negative about both these teams. What's your prediction, buddy, for this matchup at Arrowhead on Saturday? My biggest worry is that it's going to be a close game and KU's had the struggles closing out games and on key downs. So TCU this year on third and fourth down, they are fourth in the country in third and fourth down offensive success rate. Kansas defensively in those key downs, 109th. I think in a close game that matters. I'm taking TCU in a close one, bit of a high score, I guess. Uh, maybe for TCU, this is low scoring. Uh, 34 to 31, I'm going TCU on top. Uh, Kansas, I, I think they're close, but until they can get back on the win column, uh, I I'm, I got to believe it till I see it. Man, you throw me for a loop here because I also expected to come into – like the, I woke up this morning and I thought I'm going to pick Kansas on this show. But as I've gotten closer to this show and to thinking more about it, I think the Frogs pull it out. I don't have a great articulate reason for it other than I feel like they play with good effort. I think this team is better than what they've shown the last two weeks. Give me TCU 44-38 in a barn burner. I think a lot of points will be scored in this one. Uh, Derek, for the people that are watching, where can they find Locked on Jayhawks and all your work? Yep, you can get it anywhere you get your podcast. You can get it on your YouTube page. And I uh, tweet pretty much everything out, so you can give me a follow at D Johnson Radio. We'll have shows on Friday, uh, and we'll have plenty of coverage Saturday as well. Locked on Horn Frogs, Locked on Jayhawks. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. It's your team every day.